These were not Barney Oldfield and Indy drivers. These were just whoever happened to be around. Was it really an organized event? Not very organized. So would some people just get, get it in their mind to do that? Well, it would be, the polo act would be part of a thrill show. They'd do a board wall or something and they'd have auto polo and they'd do a few minor stunts. But the polo was part of the show. Were any of these nearby? Oh, they had them in Mansfield quite frequently. They'd show up any place there was a fairground where they had a track and a grandstand. Okay. <laughs> and that, what year was that? Oh, this would be in the 1920s. See, at that time, you could buy a brand new Model T for $250, $275. The whole car, brand new. And they were cheap, so used ones were anywhere from a hundred dollars down. There were a lot of Model T's that sold for twenty or twenty-five dollars. Was gas expensive? Uh, low test gas sold as low as fourteen cents a gallon, including tax. Regular gas sold for about 16 to 17, and the high test sold for a couple cents more. Oil was 25 cents a quart. What about tires? Well, most of them were high pressure tires, and uh, you could buy a new tire for four or five dollars. Were there any other types of vehicles on the road, other than cars? Well, there were a few electric cars. Oh, really? Uh, the old ladies that belonged to the Sunday School Club were the best customers for electric cars, because they were silent, and they had no confusing gear shift. All they had was what they called a tiller, which was a lever that you push back and forth to turn right or left. And the other was a lever that you pushed forward to go forward and you pulled it backwards to go backward. And the farther you pushed it, the faster it went. And it was hard to tell one end from the other. The back end that had the batteries in it looked just like the front end. <laughs> it was sometimes hard to tell whether the person driving it was going backward or forward. But they were heavy and cumbersome, but uh, they rode real smooth. They went over the bumps real nice. And of course, they, they were absolutely soundless when they ran. What was the name? Old Baker was probably the best known. There were half a dozen or so different manufacturers. They never used those in the thrill show? Oh, heavens, no. First place, they were too expensive. Second, they were too heavy with all those batteries. And third, they didn't have enough speed. 30 miles an hour was about it. Were there any carriages on the road still at that time? Oh, sure. What was the ratio? Oh, it depends on how big the town was. Well, in 1920, the average small town was probably half automobile, half horse. So would you say, what do you think people had more faith in at that time? 
more faith. Yeah, in getting them where they were going. Oh, that depend on the person and what road he was on. In bad weather, why, the boat would go to the horse. Oh, really? Well, a Model T could get in mud clear up to the differential on a township road. It was only a few roads that you could really travel on all year. Besides, heaters were unknown, and uh, there were very few sedans. Most cars just had side curtains, which in, until 1924 or so, the side curtain didn't open with the door. You had to squeeze under it. Did your first Chevy have a roof? Oh yeah, it was a, you, today you'd call it a coach. Why is that? Well, because it didn't have seats like a sedan, and it was bigger than a coupe. Was there any glass in it? Well, sure, in the windows and the back window and the windshield. So it had all that? It had all that. You only kept that for a year, eh, that chubby? Yeah, about a year, and then I, being a young guy, I wanted something sportier. I sold the thing, and I paid all the way to $19 for a Whippet Roadster, 1927. It looked pretty good, but mechanically it was shot. I don't think the guy that owned it ever even put any oil in it. Why do you figure it was sportier? Well, it was a roadster, for heaven's sake, with wire wheels and a rag top. And it was pretty. Uh, that car would look good today if it was painted. Did it have any wood on it? Well, there was wood in the body. The, door, uh, the doors were wood framed with a metal overlay. There was quite a bit of wood in the body. I guess the, t the tires were tubeless? Oh, they never heard of tubeless tires. Oh, they were tube tires. Yeah, you didn't even have balloon tires yet. You still had high pressure. Did they last long? Not too long, no. I remember when the local tire factory, Mansfield Tire, put a thousand mile guarantee on the tire, everybody thought they'd go broke replacing them. Then it went to 3,000, then 5,000. If you went to Cleveland and back, you expected one or two flats. On the way? Yeah, before you got the trip done, a lot of people carried two spares. People who traveled a lot, like salesmen or somebody. And they would have to replace them every trip? Well, you'd have to change one about every 50, 60 miles. If you drove that far without getting a flat, you were doing pretty good. Why was that? Well, because the tires weren't any good, <laughs> neither were the roads. There were also streetcar tracks that would cut them. You mean if they were crossed over? Well, if they would run parallel and drop down in the, where the track was. See, the steel wheels of the cars flattened out the rail on top like a rivet. It pounded the steel down and the edge of the rail had a sharp flange made by those wheels. And that would be like a knife with a blade a half inch wide. You can drop your wheel down in there and cut the side right off your tire. <laughs>
When did the when did the bigger balloon tires start? Our first car that had balloon tires was 1924. What make? Overland. So you could that was the first car they could change pressure in. Well, it had demountable rims too. Up till then, you changed the tire right on the wheel. The rim didn't come off. Hmm. You were uh, you were telling me something about when I remember we were talking about tires with and teeter, the um, the ramp jumps. What about them? Was it so, well? There was something about the tire pressure. Well, all the stunt cars carried 50 pounds, and they were four-ply tires. If you used six-ply tires, the sidewall would crack. They weren't flexible enough. It would crack when? When you did jumps and so on. The six-ply tire will carry weight at 20 miles an hour, but you can't roughhouse it. The, the sidewall always flexes the same place <coughs> on a six-ply tire, and that breaks down the sidewall. They didn't have steel radials. They just had cord, cotton. And if you put, now you would assume, and this was another thing the engineers assumed that they didn't know, that six-ply tires would be stronger but they were not. They would break down twice as quick as four-ply because the four-ply would flex and not break. It's that simple. What was the normal pressure? Normal pressure on the, well, most of the Plymouth Sun used 670, 57017 or 616, and uh, you would have 25 to 28 pounds pressure in the tires for normal driving. And we put 50 pounds in for the show. What would happen if uh, it was regular pressure? Uh, when you made a high jump, you'd come down so hard and possibly the rim would cut the tire. And that's why the that's why the double pressure. Yeah. To withstand that pound. Also, they steered quicker. They steered quicker. Yeah, the tire was harder. You can turn the. Remember, you didn't have power steering. You can turn the wheel quicker, and the car, the wheel being harder, would follow the tire quicker. In other words, you can steer them sharper. You had more control. Were, uh, were you there the first time Teeter did a ramp jump? Oh, no. He had done ramp jumps six months before I was with the show. Had you heard about them? I'd seen them, pictures of them. From where? Well, Barney Oldfield put on a show at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1933, and they did a few primitive ramp jumps in there. And Barney did them? Well, the crew did it. Barney didn't do all the driving. Who was on his crew? Evans, I don't know, whoever they hired. Oh. Anybody could do it. My wife could do it. <laughs> so Teeter wasn't necessarily there at the World's Fair in Chicago? He wasn't there at all. Well, he wasn't the first to do a ramp jump then. Oh, Lord, no. Oh, I didn't know that. Somebody probably did it before I was born. A ramp jump? Not a big one, but a primitive one, maybe. Huh. Almost bound to, because it's so easy to set up.
So what what year would you guess they would have tried it out originally? Oh, that'd be anybody's guess back in the 1920s. There were cars around when you were a boy, yeah? Like just a small boy? Oh, yeah. Did your father have a In fact, when I was...